Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani More, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones, Ancestors at the Crossroads of Sex, Magic, and Science, where we are in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. I'm your host, Pavani More, and I'm delighted to introduce you today to Dr. Jenny Wade. Dr. Wade is an internationally known lecturer, teacher, and researcher specializing in consciousness studies and developmental psychology. She holds a PhD in human development from the Fielding Institute, and she is on faculty at Sophia University, where she teaches classes on the evolution of consciousness in altered states triggered by sex. A published author and lecturer on a wide variety of topics, she has written the groundbreaking book, Transcendent Sex, When Lovemaking Opens the Veil, and you can find it at transcendentsex.org. Her book is based on narratives of 91 people who went to bed with their lovers and suddenly had an awe-inspiring experience that forever changed the way they understood themselves and reality and the power of sex and the body as a path to realization. Hi, Dr. Wade. This is Pavani More. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for making time to speak this morning. I really appreciate it. Oh, sure. Well, let me tell you a little bit, if it feels okay, about my research. So I, um, uh, I'm a somatic sex therapist, and I work with mostly queer and trans clients who have sexual trauma. And um, mm-hmm. was realizing in my practice that while we could really address the trauma in the living person um, and, you know, interrupt any cycles of abuse, um, that a lot of my clients were walking around really feeling like they were carrying wounds of the past, like that they were carrying Uh stuff from their parents or their grandparents or their family. um, And I didn't know how to help them with that. And so that Uh kind of sparked this dissertation of really wanting to figure out, okay, so what do we do about that? And so um, that's just kind of the grounding. And um, so I've been conducting interviews with all different kinds of people. Um, the first, the first set of interviews was about was talking with people about their personal experiences um, of working uh-huh. with working with ancestors to um, support the development of sexual wellness. And then the series that I'm in right now is talking with people whose work I respect professionally, just to kind of check in with them about their work and any insights that they might have about the thoughts that I'm having about these things. Yeah, so that's kind of where the work is coming from. So I'm curious in your research you know, you're writing about transcendent sexual experiences. Do you feel like there's any benefits um, of those experiences for survivors of sexual trauma? Like, is there a healing benefit that could be possible? And if so, would you be willing to speak a little bit about it? Yes, I certainly do. Um, a lot of the imagery that comes up in those kinds of transcendent experiences, I think, has a direct bearing on uh, trauma or traumatic relationships that people had. I didn't speculate a lot about this in the book because in the book I was primarily interested in just documenting what kinds of experiences do come up for people and describing those phenomenologically. But um, And I'm not a clinician, but I would say for anybody who is psychologically inclined, it was pretty easy to discern in the kinds of imagery either some kind of trauma that was revealing itself albeit, you know, in very symbolic terms, or you could sometimes see or, you know, very plainly, and the, and the individual could see the resolution of trauma in the kind of imagery or whatever it was that came up. And in most cases like that, it was, well, depended on the degree of psychological sophistication of the individual. For some people, it was very easy to discern what it was, even though it might not have been easy in the moment, but subsequent to whatever experience they had, they, when they were beginning to integrate it for themselves, they could, um, you know, they could, they could see what was going on or speculate on what had been uh-huh. going on. And one of the examples is the case of Artemis in the book, this woman who, who's, uh, I don't remember if they were roommates, but anyway, her closest friend in college 
and she had, you know, uh, apparently heterosexual lives. They both got married shortly after they were in college or graduate school together, but, and the couples then continued to see each other, and then there's this one occasion, Artemis suddenly realized that what she was experiencing in the room with her friend and what had always seemed special about their relationship was a degree of sexual tension that she'd been oblivious to all of this time. And she realized that she wanted to explore the sexual angle of the strong relationship that she had with this woman. And so they did. (laughs) And she had such a non-dual experience that it had no content. She literally didn't remember anything in the here and now after the woman kissed her. She was just off someplace else. And, but when she came back, she realized then that she was in love with this woman. This woman had probably been in love with her, and she really wanted to pursue that. But she was in a marriage, and she really loved her husband. Too, and she did not want to disrupt that. So she and her husband had a whole series of conversations about that, and uh, she wanted to get in touch with this friend, but her friend was so frightened by the experience that Artemis had had that she wanted absolutely nothing to do with her. Mm-hmm. And although the relationship was a special one to her, she'd had other relationships with women before, and it wasn't all that special, but for Artemis, it was like this huge revelation and with further reflection she also put it together that she had completely rejected the feminine side of herself because her mother was schizophrenic she had grown up with a crazy mother and uh, she was the youngest of of her all-male siblings so she'd grown up with brothers and been a tomboy and had really put on this masculine persona because she didn't want to be like the only, you know, strong female presence in her life. And what she said she eventually got out of this experience was the beginning of a way to be feminine and to find that part of herself and to integrate it. So the the trauma that she had originally wasn't sexual, but it was certainly a traumatic connection with, with the feminine. And this was a story that I heard repeated among other women, I never heard guys telling that kind of a story, but a number of women had had real difficulty feeling sexual or embracing their sexuality in one way or another until they had some kind of a transcendent sex experience that suddenly showed them, even though it might have been indirectly at first, as it was with Artemis that being feminine is okay and embracing your femininity in it, both its genderedness and its sexuality is okay. Mm-hmm. And so that came up fairly frequently. With some of the other experiences, it was just healing other kinds of trauma. There was a gay man whose case I reported in the book who had a scary experience and he's sexual experience, a man that he just, Encountered on the street a number of times. I read that. That's the Kiko one. Yeah. Yeah. And he realized that that the the scary imagery, and it's all in the book, so I don't need to repeat it, but that the scary imagery was about, you know, are you really big enough? Can you be big enough? Can you be fully yourself like I am? You know, can you be a powerful man like me? And, you know, so that was part of the healing thing for him. And so for a number of people, the whatever came up in the transcendent thing was a piece that was in their subconscious. I mean, it was probably like any other kind of altered state therapy. You know, when you're de- deliberately doing something therapeutic in terms of what your subconscious reveals is something that's been split off or repressed or denied or somehow has not been integrated for you. And the transcendent experience offers an opportunity to recognize that, the degree of skill in integrating it, because those things don't happen in a therapeutic setting, is often just, you know, left up to the individual. And some people are able to integrate it fairly successfully or to get help integrating it, and other people don't. Yeah, I really appreciated all of the um, the care with which you documented, like, what you need to do to integrate and, and support around that. I felt like that was really... Um, ethical and uh, helpful just for my research in terms of 
kind of coming up with like effective principles of working with ancestors, right? So like how, what are the things that are um, helpful in, in order to have integration over those experiences? I'm curious because I, I think what I hear you saying is that because you say that the um, people who have survived sexual trauma or abuse, I don't know if you say sexual trauma, you say abuse, are often more likely to have transcendental sex experiences. And I just, I'm curious if, like, if there's something, I've heard Dr. Stan Groff talk about how we have an inner healing impulse or an inner healing wisdom. And it sounds like maybe there's a way that our, that we manifest these healing experiences for ourselves. Is that your thought? Or? I, I, I will, I don't know if it's quite that elegant or <laughs> parsimonious, but I guess we, I mean, we know that people who sustain early damage, you know, whether it's intrauterine damage, you know, prenatal damage or whatever it is, the, the earlier the damage, um, the more it, it can incline people to experience altered states. People who have thin boundaries, for example, usually had very early trauma and mm-hmm. that's, that's been fairly well documented. So, yes, the tendency for some people to go into altered states is probably a marker for early trauma. And some of that can just be developmental trauma. Um, there have been some studies, and I can't quote them, but that, that indicate that people who have oh, genetic abnormalities or who um, just are genetically sort of weaker, like, I mean, just having, you know, a white chromosome is a weaker state than an X chromosome. So if you have a guy who has a lot of recessive traits, for example, uh, somebody who is left-handed, red-haired, blue-eyed, and male, the likelihood that somebody with that collection of recessive traits, you know, will have had, will be a little bit more susceptible to altered states because of all those different sort of developmental issues is higher than it would be for somebody who has none of those characteristics. Mm -hmm. So it can be, uh, the trauma, I'm putting that in quotation marks, can be, you know, from uh, some kind of genetic predisposition, um, but then it can also be situational. And, you know, and can come from acts, you know, later on acts within the family. But there's also, if you know Groff's work, there's a huge amount of stuff that happens uh, prenatally that can uh, create susceptibility for things like this. And so when people are in an altered state, whatever brings that about, uh, you know, if it's if they're taking drugs, uh, you know, recreational drugs, if they are involved in some kind of guided imagery, if they're involved in a regression process, or if they're having this kind of sex, they can suddenly find themselves in a state that, has the same phenomenology as that earlier state where whatever it was occurred. And if it's a pre-verbal state, I mean, which is particularly, you know, sensitive to re-evoking body memories, mm-hmm. um, it, all that can be brought up, whether those are ones that happened after birth or ones that happened prior to birth. Mm-hmm. And um, because the imagery that we produce is often fairly veiled or is, is fairly symbolic. It's not always easy to discern, oh, this is a prenatal memory rather than, you know, this is something that happened to me uh-huh. that, that my parents did or, or some other caretaker. Uh-huh. But it's the aspects of the altered state because they replicate some of those phenomenological conditions. That's why a lot of this imagery can emerge there. You know, that, that you know, that's, that's why it, it pops up and, I think another thing that conduces to that is most of us have a sexual relationship, a voluntary sexual relationship with a partner who somehow, you know, replicates in their being or in the relationship dynamic something about our early caretakers, right. whether it's a positive dynamic or a negative yeah. dynamic. And so because uh, certainly not, I mean, you can have an altered state experience all by yourself. But even if you're having it all by yourself, a lot of times your fantasy material, uh, erotic fantasy material, is based on early caretaking patterns, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the, whatever those were. Mm-hmm. So um, there's just something about sex, maybe because it involves an other and because 
you know, there is some kind of an, even if it's very you know, implicit power exchange and so forth, you know, can bring up all the early eroticism and whatever else was surrounding early eroticism. I just made a connection and I want to check it out with you. Um, mm-hmm. So my, you know, the, a lot of the work that I'm doing is in, um, is in transgenerational generational trauma and epigenetics and looking at how trauma gets passed down family lines. And one of the interesting things about traumatic experience, right, is the perceptions of time and how like traumatic memory is, you know, not in, in a linear integrated sequence, things get very fragmented and people who are having those traumatic experiences can't like necessarily express the, the trauma in a cohesive narrative and, and some of the work of repair is, is to help that happen. And, but there's this, there's a lot written about like how time gets disrupted during trauma, whether it's sexual trauma mm-hmm. or any kind of like an accident, right? People talk about it. Yeah. And in sex, you're also documenting that there's a, um, a real element of time morphing, changing, shifting, like the, the rules that we kind of conventionally agree to, not necessarily applying. And then you said mm-hmm. that the, the states of early trauma can get unconsciously replicated and then played out, and that might be someone's transcendental sex experience. And I just hadn't put that together, that those, those states are the same of like sex time and trauma time might be the same or, you know, some way in the body that we're experiencing time like differently. Yes, I, w- I would agree very much with that. A uh, sense of clock time is comes from the left hemisphere, uh-huh. and people who are really strongly left hemisphere dominant are, you know, they're those people who can take a nap and wake themselves up at four o'clock, or they can wake up and they know it's two thirty in the morning, and you know, within five minutes or so, they're they're right on. You know, they look over the clock, and sure enough, you know, it's two thirty three or something like that. Um, people who live in their left hemispheres do that. When we have sex, most of us are not in our left hemisphere. Sex is a more right hemisphere activity. It involves, uh, besides just the regular body stuff, it involves usually a lot of imagery. Even if you've got your, your eyes closed and you're fantasizing, if you're not tuned into your body, many people are having visual images come up. And most of that is right hemisphere dominant. There is no sense of linear time in the right hemisphere. Just doesn't do it. People who are right hemisphere, strongly right hemisphere dominant, have trouble with time all their lives. They don't make deadlines. They're always running late. They can't drive a process to closure. Um, you know, they, it just doesn't, there's no clock time over there. Right. And the limbic system structures, which are where, you know, a lot of the emotional stuff happens, you know, they feed into the right hemisphere. And so when you're engaging in sex, because that kind of instinctive behavior is very limbically driven, fighting, freeing, fucking, feeding, like the four Fs are all, you know, really tightly controlled by lower brain centers of cerebellum stuff and then set up into the limbic system, which gives them a strong overlay of emotion. So you really feel good if you're feeding or fucking, and you really feel bad if you're fleeing or fighting. You know, it's, it's, it's got that strong emotional charge for survival purposes. And so when most of us are, you know, making love or engaged in sex, we've got a lot of emotional stuff driving it. It's just basic biology, and there's no sense of time in that part of the brain either. Uh So, yeah, we're kind of floating in time. And, of course, the limbic system, with all the fear stuff, is what's triggered in trauma. And people get stuck in their limbic loops, and that's why sort of all the CBT in the world, cognitive behavioral therapy, isn't going to help people who have a trauma background right. you know you need to work with them at that more so i mean that's really why a lot of symbolic forms of therapy work much better with people who've been traumatized because right. you've got to talk to that part of the brain in the language that it knows which it's not words yeah. and not it's not linear it's not logical yeah so it's just kind of accessing the different part of the brain to be able to heal the part that that part that was hurt Right, yeah. and you're absolutely right that those are the parts 
that are also much more up during sex, you know? I mean, unless... Mm -hmm. You know, if you're sitting there making out your grocery list, you're doing something else linear during sex, you're not really engaged in sex. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, you're split off somehow. Sex is, you know, it's right there in those, those other centers. So you, um, you talk about, like, one thing that I thought was really interesting in your notes for, like, how to create the ideal atmosphere where a transcendent experience might happen. Um, you said prolonged genital stimulation and erotic state. So what I'm thinking about my research, what I'm, how I'm holding it is that not only does the person who is alive and in front of me need to be healed, but also like all of the wounding behind them in time needs to be healed, mm -hmm. right? And so like, how the heck do we do that? And I'm just curious about this time phenomenon and so like putting that together with the high erotic states like is it possible to somehow heal the wounds of our ancestors through our own erotic stimulation and like being able to somehow use that timeless state that right brain timeless state and genital stimulation to intentionally heal those wounds I think it is, uh, particularly because there's a lot you can do energetically with it. I think that, you know, it doesn't have to happen during sex. I think it can happen, you know, that you can create state in a therapy session that, you know, will suggest that, you know, where you can bring those ancestors forward for people, you know, in some kind of a trance state and ask them what they need or talk to them about what they need and give it to them, both, you know, intentionally with, you know, with energy, with heart, uh, you know, with, with emotion and probably energetically with body scans. You know, you can invite that person's body into your client's body and, uh, and do some healing in that way. Uh, you know, with them energetically and sort of, you know, bring the former trauma to a resolution or help the person release it. And mm -hmm. wanting to check in because it, when you, you write about people's past life experiences, um, it seems mm -hmm. like um, you said that almost a, a fifth of your female clients and almost a fourth of your male clients had past life experiences. And I want to ask you a little bit about that. But before I do that, I want to ask you about the thing that you said, which is often those things are um, presenting as um, cautionary tales. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Most of the past life stuff is miserable. You know, it's not about some great life that somebody had. It's about a life that, you know, that was disastrous <laughs> in some way or other. And not, not necessarily specifically sexually disastrous. It just, things just didn't work out. Yeah. I mean, I wonder about, like, the relationship between that and ancestral trauma. I wouldn't lean in too heavily on that. Most of my experience with past life stuff seems to be the person's own present life difficulties uh, uh, just masked so that they, are, they have a different perspective on them. And, and, that, I, and I've actually done a lot of past life therapy myself, I mean, as a patient, uh -huh. um, and, and I've interviewed other uh, past life therapists, and most of them would say that the material that comes up, even if it seems like it's an actual biological past life, like, you know, I really lived in the 18th century, and I had a, an aunt who lived in the 18th century in, you know, such and such a town, or something like that, it still tends to be... I, some version of the person's present day experience just symbolized, you know, in these other characters, because it's a lot easier to talk about, gee, what happened to my aunt in the 18th century mm -hmm. in this town of Massachusetts, rather than to talk about the problem I'm having, you know, with my lover right now. Yeah. So it seems to be, they seem to be metaphorical. Now, some people get an awful lot of historical detail that they don't know, you know, they may not have the education to understand. And uh, I'm not trying to knock that because I believe some people really do tap into information that they don't know and, and maybe wouldn't have any way of knowing. The people that I've talked to who've had those kinds of lives tend not to, they don't necessarily say, yeah, that was me living in 
this time and place, but that was some a person that I have a resonance with, and so somehow it's like their brain is tuned to the same frequency, uh-huh. and so they don't necessarily claim to be that person, but there's a lot that resonates between them and and that that previous person. Uh-huh. And one of the past life therapists that I've worked with the most actually believes that most of the past life stuff is metaphor that winds up being for a very early bi- biographical trauma that the person had. That when you really peel off all the layers of the onion that of what appears to be past life, you get down to the basic, to the core issue in that person's real life, which is usually pre or perinatal. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, you know, they can go into their real life and then they can resolve it. Uh-huh. Whatever it is. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because then they don't need all the masks, you know, it don't, I don't have to, it, you know, it can come to me in a way that's not disguised. It's sort of like dream therapy, you know, where the, all the characters in the dream are really you but they don't appear to be you in the dream. Mm-hmm. And, but it's easier for you to deal with the dream characters. Right, because you, know? you can, uh, it's yeah. kind of a little degree of separation. Yeah. Yeah. Would you be willing to speak a little bit more about, because you said that um, some of the participants really did believe they were accessing the lives of their direct line of ancestors. And I'm just curious, like there was one person you interviewed, Catherine, who it sounded like, she was experiencing um, that with her ancestral home in Spain, and oh, oh, yeah, she did feel, yeah, she strongly felt like that, and she was the one who was so desperate to uh, recreate that experience and yeah. and see how it ended, and she was never able to do that. But that is really all I know about her experience. She was not in therapy, and she wasn't very solidly with the guy that she was having sex with during that particular experience. So I, and because she was not able to replicate it, I have never known any more about it than I reported there. She definitely wanted to have the experience again. And by trying to recreate it with this guy, she was never able to do it. And I don't know whether after that she tried to do it by going to see a hypnotherapist or somebody who do regression work. I have no idea if she was ever able to go in and find what she thought was the rest of that story. Yeah. Okay. But you did, are there, there were other people also who had ancestral experiences. Yeah. Uh, Yes. um, But for most of them, it was, it was vague. It was, I just, I felt like I was all the women in my family or all the women who gave birth to me, you know, you know, going back over the generations and that something about the way I was having sex was healing all of them. Uh-huh. And so it was vague. It wasn't necessarily specific to a particular individual. I see. So it was more like my present experience of sex is healing for my entire line. Yes. Uh, and usually, of course, those were, those were people who had um, significant, you know, they, they identified with trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and and these were usually the women who had felt very damaged in their sexuality or their genderedness. Mm-hmm. It's one of the questions that I was asking in the personal interviews was, does our personal healing impact our ancestors? Um, and unequivocally, what participants said was yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yes. Some people say absolutely it does, and you can. I mean, there's no way to verify that. Right. You only have the person's subjective felt exactly. sense. Exactly. And oftentimes, and, and you know, to what extent is their felt sense just because they resolve their trauma? Right. And they would like to yeah. believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if they resolve their trauma, I mean, in theory, it means, uh, you know, so that the intergenerational transfer of intergenerational crap you know, stops there. Right. (laughs) You know, I'm not going to pass along whatever my bad stuff was because now I'm healed and I, I will treat my offspring in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Did you come across anybody who had sex with their ancestors or was, um, had ancestral consciousness during their sexual encounters? 
I didn't, but one of my uh, former students did, and knowing that I was going to talk to you today, I brought up her dissertation. She tried to replicate my research with an all-lesbian sample uh-huh. for her for her dissertation, and she did report a story that um, I wanted to just tell you about, and if you if you're more interested, you could pursue it with her. Okay. She says, um, Kelly M. reported a powerfully healing vision of her uncle's sister, whom he had hardly known, as well as a vision of her partner's parents, whom she had never met because they died at a young age. In both cases, the ancestors in these visions gave Kelly M. validation and support regarding her relationship. While Kelly M. was initially fearful of reporting her vision to her partner, as they were very new lovers, and she had never had any unusual or non-ordinary experiences in her life before she had this vision, her partner found what she reported to be extremely comforting and validating. Mm -hmm. And so this is the verbatim part of the record that Kelly said. She made love to me, and she made it very clear she was the goddess. There's a visualization that came to me, working with the crone. Going down, the yoni can represent a cave. The cave is a gateway to the goddess. I hate to use the word vagina because it's just so rude. The vulva is a cunt. I like to call it the yoni because it's a very sacred term to me, but it's cave-like. I love to be inside another woman's cave. In this case, I went inside the cave. I went down the steps. And at the bottom of the steps, in this particular visualization, I always see the crone. And at the bottom of the steps, it was her as the crone. So I knew it was really a sacred thing. The relationship didn't go too much past that festival, but it was a very sacred, but it was very sacred on a very sacred night. Hmm. And my girlfriend and I had gone to my aunt's and uncle's cabin for the weekend We had been making love, and I saw a vision of my uncle's sister, who was the original owner of this cabin, she and her husband. The sense that I got when I saw them was that they were very happy that there was so much love in the place where they'd spent time together. In the course of that, they kind of transformed into my girlfriend's parents. I knew when I saw them who they were. I had the same sense with them, that they were very happy. The whole experience was very moving. I don't normally see people who have passed away. They were people from our past who were very pleased with what we share. It was like it brought in, I don't know, people from the outside of the relationship into our life. Yeah, that's fascinating. I do want to just say that I think because of the difficulty of, you know, being a sexual minority in our culture, that many of the people, uh, many of the lesbians in her sample, and many of the gay or lesbian or trans people that I talk to, a lot of their sexual imagery is about healing trauma or like the things that I read, it's something about validating their sexual choice, mm-hmm. you know, that I don't want to say it's not really a choice, but, you know, validating their non-conforming sexuality, you know, their non-mainstream uh-huh. sexuality. Whereas the imagery and the stories that I got from heterosexual people didn't tend to include that fundamental a conflict about their sexual identity or their gender identity, about, you know, really who I am, unless they had been Catholic. And if they were Roman Catholic and had, you know, they had gotten all these messages about it's not okay to be sexual, then if they were heterosexual, that kind of imagery would come up. Uh-huh. But most of the sort of sexual or gendered trauma either was about, you know, having a non-mainstream choice in our society, you know, or a non-mainstream preference or sexual expression or belonging to some kind of a religion that absolutely forbade sex or, you know, or oppressed sex, sexual expression, except in some very prescribed ways. That's curious. I'm, I'm wondering, we talked about the, um, the healing impulse. So that's a really significant difference, right? The, the, the folks with either Catholic trauma or sexual minority trauma would have imagery that would be affirming through these transcendental experiences, whereas 
folks in the sexual mainstream wouldn't. That seems really significant to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it just, and it makes me really curious about like, where are those experiences coming from? Like, and is that an innate healing force that's inside of us that can create that for ourselves? Mm. I would say, I, I, yeah, I, I think it, I think it is. You know, in, again, in the right conditions, most of these people, most of them, were reporting some kind of a sexual adventure with a, an accepting partner. So there was something about the sex that made them feel good about themselves. Mm-hmm. Just the sexual act. Forget the forget the imagery. They were usually in some kind of a sexual connection. Now, it might not have been a committed long-term relationship. I mean, with some people, it was still very transient sex, but I think a lot of people are able to express themselves more freely yeah. in a transient relationship because they don't have to worry, what's this gonna, person going to think of me? Or, gee, do I look, you know, awkward doing this? Or, you know, I'm doing this thing that I would never normally do because I'm never going to see this person again and I don't care what they think. So oftentimes there was something liberating or perhaps uh, self-affirming in the fundamentals of whatever the sexual encounter was. Um, So what are you as a researcher left with after that huge study of, you know, why these things happen? I think, you know, sex is a very powerful and emotional and energetic force that we all have within us. And if, you know, at at the moments when we're not completely locked up tight, you know, it's going to break through. And I think like any other subconscious experience, you know, it carries information or it carries wisdom for us. And the more we're locked up, it's probably the more we need access to that wisdom. And so the more symbolic or even sometimes bizarre it seems because it's so different from, from the rest of our lives. I think that it's a force for healing, like just about all of our subconscious processes. You know, there's healing stuff in there if we can unlock it and if we're not so afraid of it uh, that we are able to work with it. But sometimes, you know, we just don't have the the resources, you know, the, the sophistication or the support to deal with it. And especially if it is a traumatic material or something about the relationship that we're in is traumatic. And because, you know, there may be uh, some, you know, nasty power dynamic in sexual relationship that evokes, you know, some kind of, you know, icky relationship I had with one of my caretakers. Yeah. Unless... I have a lot of resources outside of that relationship to help me recognize what's going on and break that and probably break the relationship. Say, you know, this may feel sexually intense and I may be really attracted to this because it evokes these early erotic impulses of mine. But this is clearly just like that relationship I had when I was helpless. I was on the you know, sort of the wrong end of the power exchange, I couldn't extricate myself. And as erotically compelling as it may be, this is really not good for me. And, you know, and get out of it and then, you know, work with it somebody else. So it's a powerful force, but I think it takes a, a lot of power and sophistication to be able to sort of use it for the good, you know, or, or resolve it. And, um, and it's something to, you know, not not everybody has. I mean, you know, yeah, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> you. You see it all around. People who remain in highly dysfunctional relationships because there's a strong erotic bond. Sure. And, you know, and you can just see how bad it is for, you know, for them. But uh, they, they can't break out of it. Right. And, you know, and there were plenty of people like that in my study who knew that, it wasn't good, but they stayed because there was a sexual charge with that person they couldn't get with anybody else. Well, yeah. why? Yeah, yeah, because it it reactivated really early dynamics for them that weren't weren't very positive either. Yeah, and, and I just want to say like this has been so valuable for me. Oh, well, I'm just, glad. I, mean, <laughs> I really wasn't sure I could be very very contributing at all, but well, thank you. Yeah, I feel like I had a really big putting those things that thing together about trauma time and sex time. Like that's just uh-huh. like a huge piece for me. So um, 
thank you. And thank you for, you know, just all of the research that you did. And um, I just find it so supportive personally and professionally to have that available of like, oh, here's someone's done the study on you know these kinds of experiences. So it's lovely to be able to rest some of my work on your work. And I just Oh, good. Well, thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank you. So if you've enjoyed the interview today and you're fascinated by Dr. Waite's research, you can find out more in her book, Transcendent Sex, at www.transcendentsex.org. Thanks, folks, for listening to this episode. I'm Pavani Moray, and we'll be back next time with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. Mm-hmm.